And I didn't know actually was planning to talk about uh, how important that actually is resource to, for lack of time. It turned out that I actually presented on this topic uh, the last time, so there's a, there's a video on YouTube if you want to look at that. Since I did you a demo this morning, and I might save some time, we might actually have some, some more time to cover that, but we'll see how the presentation goes. Um, so, how do we build and deploy the, the configuration? Again, everything starts with the source of truth, and when I started, actually, somebody uh, before even I joined uh, picked up that box. So, again, why not point? Uh, and it was actually perfect for us because it was covering 80% of what it wanted. It had information about the, the network device, IP addresses, the cabling, it had uh, a pretty good uh, UI and, and API. So we really embraced that box and, and we went full deep into it. Uh, so it's just an idea of, like, for example, we've been um, using it extensively to even communicate with the other team. So in that box, for example, if you look on the uh, on the right, uh, you have all the list of interfaces, and the, the interfaces even have statuses like is this interface connected or not? This link is connected or planned? Are the device have statuses as well? And we really embrace that to a point where uh, we we asked the team to use that to tell us when they were connecting the cable, and and we made the automation so that if they will not say that this link is connected, we will not render a PGP session for it. So that was our way to actually enforce that everything in that box will be. 100% accurate is that we were building 100% of the config from it at a very, very low bar uh, point. And um, so I'll, I'll come back to this uh, system, but what was, uh, uh, and as I say, Netbox was covering 80%, and it was great because it had a great UI. It was actually solving all our team's uh, need as well, like all the team based managing the hardware. We have like the PDU in there, we have a lot of additional information just beyond our team. So <coughs> for all those reasons, we decided to, uh, to use that. And for the, the 20% that were remaining that we couldn't cover, we decided to store everything in Git. And we worked in some integration between uh, Netbox and Git in, uh, in our project. Um, so I mentioned we're using the, the statuses. Uh, so that's been super important uh, for many, many reasons. But that was important because that's how we communicated with the team on the ground. But that's also important because the statuses, uh, we're using them everywhere so when we're actually writing our workflow and our automation, where I'll explain later that we use all this uh, information from that box to feed into our automation to build and generate and deploy and communicate with the config. And we always refer to the status. And we're very rigorous. Like if a device is planned or staged, the expectation is that it's not IP reachable. As soon as the device goes into another state, like offline or active, then it is expected to be an IP reachable. And I explain how we hooked all of that into our monitoring system so that we only pick the device that are certain statuses and all of that. And as soon as the device gets into this new status, you automatically get picked up for, for monitoring and all. Uh, our workflow that us and the network team, we will import everything in that box, devices and cables, and we will Label everything as planned. And that was our signals to the team on the ground like, when you get the device, that's how I want it to be racked and cabled. And then they will do that and they will click on the cable and say this one is connected and this device is staged. And that becomes our signal to say, okay, now we have another workflow that will go and push the initial configurations. And then we were going through that and at the end, we will flag everything as, as active. And so we were really that as a, as a communication media with the, with the other team. And and uh, that was very important because at the end, that's, that's why we can trust it. Because everything is built from it, because it's part of the process, and there's not a, a second data source that we actually configure on the side. So now that we have this source of data, uh, how do we integrate uh, with it? Like I, I mentioned, we need now another project that will be about building, that will have the change that template, that will have the workflow. So there's really two types of integration that you need to, to think about. So the first one is you need to inventory. You need something that you can really fetch any time. So that's the beginning, the inventory, the list of the device, the role, the statuses, as I mentioned. There's some key information that are the beginning of every single workflow. Because a workflow is always a list of actions on the targeted list of device. So, and we wanted this list of device coming from that box as dynamically as possible. 
And then there's another type of workflow that we're looking at is for what we call the device properties or the device model. It's like all the information I need to actually build a configuration. And I've seen people trying to merge those two system integration into one, and I think it's a mistake because, for example, I want the inventory to resolve in less than three seconds. Stop. Like otherwise, people get annoyed. You know, every single workflow they're doing is going to be super slow because extracting all the information that we need, those device properties, that's actually something that can take times that you know you might not be able to extract that for thousands of devices or hundreds of devices. Uh, in a matter of seconds. So that's why also, and, we, and you don't need technically that for every task. You, know, you need that to build a config, but if your goal is to uh, check additional information, like just uh, collect the CRM numbers on the devices or do additional things, you don't need that. So that's why we really thought about those, those two different ways to integrate and extract information uh, from uh, the source of truth. Um, I think I, I picked that. So the tool that we picked, uh, we actually picked Ansible. Uh, to, to integrate with the device. And we picked Ansible for multiple reasons. The, the first one, it has a, a great support for dynamic inventory. There's actually some great example out there, super easy to integrate. You have uh, uh, some Python scripts, pick all this information from Netbox and collect. And also because it has, based on my experience, a very, very powerful variable system. So we were getting all those dynamic inventories, all the dynamic groups based on the name of the device, the roles, or actually any information coming from Netbox. And then we could organize the 20% of those variables that we don't have in Netbox in our source of truth, we could organize them properly using the VAR and OSTVAR and Ansible and make that super efficient for us to do that. Uh, and also, you know, there, there's been a really strong support. Our vendor, Juniper, has been investing a lot in uh, Ansible as well. And, uh, and also, the idea that it could be run on a decentralized way, uh, that was very important for us when we started we had pretty much uh, no PL servers, no central system. Like all we had was GitHub on our laptop. So being able to run everything from our laptop uh, for pretty much even to this day uh, has been uh, has been very important for us. And the fact that it's uh, decentralized also, I think, feel very in line with the, the GitHub workflow and the fact that everybody can create its own branches and all of that. But I'll, I'll get to that. So. The device model, and, and what do I mean by device model? Uh, so for us, I think you heard about the data model, and it's kind of the same. For us, one difference I mentioned is, uh, for us, device model is all the properties that I need to build the configuration. But we are trying to limit to what is really specific to device. What they call device properties, like IP addresses and ASNs and information, but not the device itself, but also about its peer. Because technically, if you're building your configurations, you don't need just your information. You need the IP address of the guys on the other side of the link and all of that. So for me, a device model is everything you need to build a config. And we were trying to really not duplicate all the information that are role specific, like routing policy and all of that for us are not part of the device model. They are part of the Jinja templates. And we're loading and attaching the Jinja templates and all of that based on specific role. And uh, we call that uh, design revisions. Like, if we have a different type of spine, we have a way to differentiate that. And we have like different uh, uh, PGP policy, for example, defined on them. name. And we ensure that all the devices that have the all of the same revision, the same type, will actually run exactly the same uh, PGP policy, for example. And, uh, and, and getting those information, this device model is actually quite challenging. I think that was one of the biggest challenges we had. And, uh, and specifically, when, when you try to think about it, like if you need to have your information, the cabling, the, the IP of your peers, like when you're building an IP fabric and all of that, just for one device, you can end up doing a lot of query on the database, like a lot of query, like 20, 40, 100 query for, for a single device because of this relational approach. Uh, so, and that takes a lot of time, that put a lot of stress on the, on the system. So, and we didn't want to have to deal with that. So what we created is we wanted a, a, a processing system in the middle between our Jinja and the database that will actually format this data and make it easy to consume and create a single dictionary that will be uh, able to consume easily. So what we started is started building that client side. So when we started, one of the things that I to mention is the speed was, was a very important factor for us. Like when I started, they already had a deadline a 
for months after I started to have things deployed in the product. So we had to move super fast. And so our, our initial approach was to have a Starting with Ansible was a big goal, very easy to create Ansible modules and, and extend Ansible, and that was something that was that was easy. Uh, so we started doing that, and we started building this device model role uh, in Ansible that will basically take information from many many sources and build everything as a single uh, system. And then, as we get more mature, uh, we actually uh, learned how to manage NetBox, learn how to productize that, and we ended up doing some extension. Uh, of NetBox, like basically created our own APIs and we, we managed to be able to extract those informations with the single API query, but pretty much the same uh, in a more efficient way. Uh, and, and now we have this workflow where we can basically like make changes to that and, and ship and package a, a new version of NetBox in a matter of, uh, of minutes. Uh, but that, that's, been a, that's been a journey. And what we're doing in this, uh, in this specific like device model, like one of the things we've been doing, for example, is uh, we're pulling like the IP, the links, and you know, saying like everything from the peers. But we're doing some pre-calculation. For example, we, we have a lot of uh, BGP, eBGP, IP fabric type, like most of our networks like that. So for us, we always need the IP on the other side. We need information about the other devices. So we, we are pre-computing all of those information. Every time we're seeing a, a slash 31 or slash 127, we're actually automatically pre-computing the list of peers. And we have the information about what is the link, what is the status of the link, what is the link of the peer, what is the IPs on both side, and the roles. And, and we made that so that it's super easy to consume our Jinja templates, and, and we don't have to make the Jinja too complicated. So, one thing that has been very successful for us, and I, I more I talk in industry, I realize that it's actually something that is not usually uh, done. Is we we took the approach to always generate 100% of the config, and we always replace the existing configurations. Like we're we're always overriding whatever is in the box every time, even if it's about changing one interface. Today we have this approach, and you will tell me like it's it's uh, it's. Uh, it's kind of crazy. And there are some downside to it, I'm not gonna have time, but the, the really upside is that it gives us such high confidence on the tools and the tool chain and the pipeline that we're building. Like for example, when I was, I had to retrofit into the automation frameworks and existing networks. I could have my workflow to take everything from the network, put in the database, do my integration, dynamic script, everything I talked about. And I was able to generate my config, and I was able to ask the device, tell me what is going to happen if I push this config. And I was getting a diff from the device that will tell me exactly what will change. Like, before even changing something, I will know from the device itself what I was going to change. And so I could iterate on my tools until the device will tell me nothing will change if you deploy this config that is now fully automated. And then that was the, the moment where I knew I could make that and that become a new way. And over the months, every time we had to refactor something, like when we had to move our, our device model from the client side to NetBox, that was a huge change. We had to change almost like everything. And same, being able to iterate and always like run all our type of configurations, like tell me what is going to change if I push that, and iterate and iterate until nothing is going to change, was extremely helpful in being able to roll out something. So, for us, we, we are learning Keras, we are learning like even the most complex configurations. But we're we're fine because every time, even to this day, people when before they deploy, they actually have a way to run a diff across the whole network. And we're working toward tools that help them understand what they're gonna push. And very often they're like, oh, something is wrong. And either somebody screwed up the information networks or somebody screwed up the templates, or but we never had really an issue where we took the network down because our actually we had a couple of times. And it's because people didn't pay us enough attention to the diffs, but the diffs were actually reporting that. So critical for us. And I understand you cannot do that on, on every type of device, but all the new device support actually is really good at that. Arista support that, iOS 6 R support that. Like pretty much it's uh, all the new devices have that. So if you're making a, or buying, it's super important that you actually um, I look at that and make that a requirement. And again, when, when the diff was good, then we will uh, make a change that we can So, I kind of presented that this morning, so I'm going to go fast. But another thing that, was, uh, that worked really well was this idea that 
we will pack into all our environments in uh, Docker and we will run it from the laptop. Now we're working toward more centralized deployments with like CI and all of that. And we use the same container in the CI environment so that, again, we never have situations where things don't work because we don't have the right libraries or the fact we just created this super uh, predictable environments and we're using it everywhere. Uh, we even now uh, derived that and we created a, an AWS versions of it and all of that so that we are 100% uh, of that. Um, so that was really the demo I did this morning. One thing I didn't touch on this morning is, and that also been uh, a good success, is we use the system a little bit further than what I showed this morning. We use it to create an environment. And one of our two challenges we're trying to solve with that is the first one was the environments let us create uh, you know, delimited zone of impact. For example, we have one environment which is the data center, and another one is the backbone. And we end up having a lot of shared pieces, but different devices and different teams that are usually working on them. So by having different environments, we are actually able to custom, when we start the container, we define a new inventory, we define a different uh, list of playbooks, we're in the same repo, so we actually still can share, like for example, the same role to generate the configuration. And it's been really helpful because that helped to help us onboard a lot of uh, new projects and new team members super easily without having to worry that they will break everything else. Like uh, now we're seeing that for, for load balancers, we did that for uh, managing our DNS, we did that for a lot of different things. And we like super easily are able to onboard new team and create them their safe environments. And we just have to tweak the make file that I was showing this morning to just so doing Mac CLI, they're going to make data center, Mac pop, Mac uh, CDN, and then they automatically start, and then they can have completely different inventory, completely different uh, system, variables, playbooks, but it's all part of the same repo, so we can uh, share the modules, share the share roles, and, and so on. Um, with just some example, uh, we based our dynamic inventory for MapBox from this uh, really great project that I put up there uh, that uh, I think we found super useful because it's like basically one Python script but it takes everything from a YAML file so we were able to have a single Python and multiple YAML files, one for each of our uh, environment. Um, that's an example of how our, our environments are uh, set up. So there is a, a NetBox that's YAML for the inventory, there's a list of playbooks, there's some Bar and close bar and all that are uh, environment specific. Uh, and that's just an example of the, of the make files that I, I show you already. So that was the part about building the configuration of where they gave you a bit of a thing of uh, what we're doing. Now we're going to jump into another part that um, I think is super interesting and I, I feel like we're there's so much people doing that honestly in the network industry we're not talking enough about it. So hopefully I can open some uh, some ideas and and, uh, and all that. But um, so what is the, the goal about the monitoring and learning? And of course we will find an issue. But there's a lot about visibility, creating dashboards, uh, being able to dive into the data and do some forensic and, and analyze and and, uh, and also some some planning. I thought it was uh, important to to agree on that. Personally, I feel. The, the system that we have right now are so not appropriate for what we're doing. Like, if you think of, I, I like to call the spine, down, the spine down syndrome. How many alerts do you get if this device goes down? Can you guess? You will get one for the alerts because the device goes down for sure. And you will get 62 alerts, 64, assuming you have story to leave because you'll probably get alerts from all the peers because the interface goes down and the PGP goes down. But technically, when you look at it, how many alerts should I get in the middle of the night? I would argue you should get zero. Because I designed my networks to be redundant. I have three other spine. I'm fine. I have plenty of capacity. And, and when you think of it, the issue is where our monitoring and system approach, for what I can tell, is very device oriented. Where I think we should really think in terms of network and topology and roles. Like, I, I don't care about a single device. All I care is that my spine moves, is healthy, and has at least 50 of capacity. So how do we do that? And that's what I'm going to try to, uh, to share with you. So first, what do we have today? And I will guess that most of us are, because we still have that actually, we're working toward 
commissioning it. But we have a, a all in one server network monitoring system that is most likely pulling information from SNMP and collecting signals. I mean, if, uh, and, and what the system have in common is they're using a tool called RD tool. I don't know if you realize that, but it's it's a tool they use by observing and Cacti and RTG and open uh, NMS and collect D. And this tool is actually introducing a lot of limitations and we don't even realize that. Like if, if you've seen those graphs, very squarely, who has not seen those graphs? Yeah, not a single hand. So this is RD. And the issue is RD is something that was built 20 years ago and that is really uh, introducing a lot of limitations on what we can do with the data. It is not a database. It's actually the graph is defined by these tools. It stores and visualizes, and pretty much the way you can visualize is defined by how you store. When you think about it, it's, it's completely different than uh, what's out there, and, and I'll talk about the alternative, but uh, we can do so much better than that. And also, so I think it's one of the reasons why we're thinking in terms of device, is because we're collecting per device. And when we collect those, those generic monitoring tools, they don't have an idea of what are your, your spine and all of that, and just put that into You can customize some of it, but you don't have the flexibility that other systems are doing. So, I personally always like to look toward you know, the server guys, there was a few errors ahead of us, and they are doing things very differently. So, if you look at a monitoring system on their side, you basically have an agent that is usually running on the server itself, and then they have a dedicated database, and they have another system that is doing the visualization, and another one that's doing the, the learning. It's kind of like they disaggregated the stack. Instead of having everything in a single one, they disaggregated that. What we're seeing as well is we're seeing different type of systems based on the data that you collect. There's now some very specialized database for metrics, because I mean, that's what I'm going to talk about. You can do some amazing things with metrics and those informations. And there are some amazing systems for logs, and like we, we are not in a, in a generic system anymore. So we have very specialized system because there's different needs to capabilities and features that we need. And, um, and and what's very interesting is all of them can scale independently. So all of that we can actually use that in the network. Like uh, Neil was actually showing that this morning, he, he, they are using Prometheus and, and all of that. And there's no reasons why we would not use that. The only difference is we don't have an all-in-one solution really to use. We need to invest a bit more time, but the outcome and the benefits are, are so much better that I, I really think it's, uh, it's important. So, one thing happened in this space is there's been a, a big revolution that started, I think, around 2013, it's where there were all new generations of uh, databases uh, that started to, um, to come up that are really dedicated for this type of data. I don't know if you've heard about InfluxDB or Prometheus or Timescales. The system really started in 2013. They're really mature now. They've been for, for many years. And, uh, and there's some, some really interesting. And the idea is that you have this super powerful query engine. And it completely decorrelates how you store and how you visualize. Actually, when you think of it as a database, it makes total sense. Like, that's what the database has been doing. But when you think coming from our D tools, it's like complete disruptions because we have not been thinking this way. We've just been consuming those graphs. We have not been thinking in terms of, I should learn this query language to, to do that. And um, just some example of tools in these ecosystems and all the things that there are. The, the, the open source world is, is super, super dynamic in the world network. So I'm going to give you an introduction to those time series database. And I'm going to explain that, not because I expect every one of you to go and build one. I understand you know, where most of us network engineers we don't expect to build tools, but I think it's important that you understand the capabilities of the system and you understand what kind of requirements you need to give to the guy who's going to build that. And, and I think it's super important to think about it because even the vendors are talking about, like, I used to work for Juniper and I used to teach about that and I realized how I was doing it wrong because I think I was not explaining it properly to actually make it useful and I'm going to explain why. So if you look at those systems, there's basically, there's not some problems it's like, that's my change of template type. So basically the idea is usually we have a measurement, which is the name that defines what is the type of data. Here's going to be interface output bytes. The numbers are actually, I'm going to talk about. Then there's a collections of tags or label that you attach to this data that defines 
in which context it was, it was collected. So usually minimum for interface will be the name of the device, the name of the interface. And then you have a, a value, which is this uh, 45697, uh, which actually define the counter. So here's like an absolute counter in terms of how many uh, bytes went through this, uh, this specific interface. And that's how you store. Now, how you visualize depends on, on the query you're making, and it is defined on the fly. So if I look, for example, from one device, if I look at those counters, those counters are pretty boring because you know it's like absolute numbers, they keep increasing. That doesn't give me a lot of information. Like if I look at one, it's just a line that increases. But now, what our RD has been doing for years that you may or may not realize it was it was getting those counters, but on the fly it was actually calculated the rate. And in this new world, the rate is just a function. Where you say, hey, I, I actually want you to calculate the rates on the fly for all these different interfaces based on the dimension for a single device. And then the system will do that and it will calculate that on the fly for you. So now you actually have actual data. But what's interesting is that if you don't want the rate for every single interface, let's say you want actually the aggregated rate of the device itself, then now you can do, I would like the sum of the rates of all my interfaces on this device. And then on the fly, the system will actually calculate that for you and you can visualize that dynamically. Meaning, you don't have to know when you store exactly what you're going to do with this data. Now, what's super important uh, is that you need to understand, uh, and I'll come back to that. So, and other things you can do, you can do a division. Like, if you don't want the rate in, in by per second, but you want a percentage, you can actually do the same. I would like to calculate my rates on my interfaces, and I would like to divide that on the fly by actually the speed of my interfaces, and then boom, you get the percentage of utilization of a specific interface. And what I was uh, mentioning earlier is that now you need to think of what is the relevant tags, the labels that I need to put on this data when I put it in the database that will be useful for me later to use and consume this data. For example, if you are, I'm, I'm actually collecting interface for, uh, you know, my, my transit interfaces, one important label might be I want to know the name of the providers, I want to know the name of the device on the other side, or I might want to know the role of my interface so that I can do, give me the aggregated traffic of all my applets automatically. The issue is if you don't put this tag at the time you're insert in the database, you won't be able to make this query later. You will only be able to see I want all my interface or you will have to resonate in terms of names. And it's super important that the, the more meaningful tags you get on a specific data, the more query and the way you will be able to consume that, uh, that later on. So here, for example, if I have a routers that have many types of uh, you know, transit interface, many providers, I don't really need to know if I have one interface with providers or multiple. Here I can just say, give me a sum by providers of the rates of my uh, interfaces and then the system will automatically pick them. But I can only do that because I have the right text. And that's why I, I, I spent some time explaining that. As you build your monitoring system, it's super important that you understand, can I insert the tags? Where do I get the tags? And how do I do that? So that's why we decided uh, to actually build our own collector today because you can understand that the, the world is uh, Today, is, uh, there's not a lot of, uh, of tool in this space. Uh, so we decided to do that because we wanted this collector uh, to be able to insert the tags that we wanted, and we wanted this collector to... Uh, um, and, and one thing is, if you look at the... Where do I get the tag? So, you know, for example, if you look at the device itself, you, you can try to put a lot of information in the descriptions, but you won't get everything. Like for example, I was telling you, like we have something that we call the device revision, which for us is like I have a role, which is a spine, but I have multiple evolution of this role. I have the revision one, revision two, revision three. For us, super important that we put those tags in the data. But when I look at the device, I don't have this information on the configuration itself. Like the configuration is the result of my automation building this configuration for this role, but I don't really have it clearly defined. So what, and, and when you look at the device, what Frank's playing, there's a lot of things you don't get. So what we did is we wanted to have an integration with the source of tools with NetBox to get the device inventory, of course, but also to get the roles, to get all those attributes that are super important for us that might not actually be in the configuration, like for 
for a spine, for example, we also have, or any role in the network, we define what we call the service group. So we have a specific DAG that defines that all the spines are part of the same, they are providing the same functions to my network. Super important for me because that's how I want to group them. I technically almost never look at all my spines, I just want to look at the spines that are part of the same pod. Or a part of it. So all those informations, you don't get them from the device easily. So we decided to go with the, uh, to the integration as a source of truth. And, um, and we also had an, a similar approach after we get the data, when we actually process the alerts, we created a system that is able to, when it gets all those alerts, those 63 alerts, that will be able to check the source of truth. Like, hey, I'm getting an alerts for this device. What is the status of this device? Oh, this device is not in production. So I'm going to silence the alerts. And this system is also able to reconcile uh, those interface and BGP from multiple sides of the link, where you get those information, you're actually able to look in that box and say, oh, what is this device? What is this IP? What is the device on the other side? And if the device on the other side is actually clearly labeled as a, as a maintenance mode, then we automatically silence all those alerts because we know that we don't need to alert for a device that is not supposed to be in production. So we created and we made all those, uh, those integrations. Uh, so the collectors actually we, we build uh, is on, uh, if you're interested, it's on uh, GitHub. Um, it has, I think, some interesting bits that uh, you know, it has the dynamic inventory. Uh, you can actually create easily extend your own. We, we work in these systems where everything is based on the tags. Like we don't want to think about device. We want to define a monitoring profiles for type of device. And all that. There's all these tagging systems. And right now we support Juniper and uh, F5. Um, there's some discussions on adding more, but uh, it's, um, it's been in fruition for us for a uh, number of years. It's been pretty uh, successful. Well, one approach that we uh, also that is a little different with the industry is uh, we decided to use NetConf to collect information from the device. And why we did that is really about how much data can I get through a specific interface. Like, for me, what's important if I invest time in building all these frameworks is that I have the ability to collect as much data as possible, not in terms of volume, but in terms of what kind of data. Like, I have this example I, I found live on is that someday it becomes critical that I collect the, the size of DHCP really, DHCP really pool on all my top of rack because the server guys were in situations where they had hundreds of servers they needed to bring a line and they couldn't see them because, you know, they had too many of them and the pool was getting full and so they came with this request, like, can you give us visibility on that? And that becomes top priority. And if you look at that, those kind of data, you don't get them probably even through SNMP, you don't get them through telemetry streaming, you don't get them or you actually probably only get them through the CLIs or through uh, the APIs interface. So for us, that was making a lot of sense to invest in this API system because that will give us access to the biggest pool of information and in most cases, actually, we're able to pull it out like every one minute, two minutes, and it's, it's largely enough for, for what we're doing. I have a slide, I can talk about it, the, the system that we build. Um, and just to close, I have a couple of uh, dashboards uh, just to show you. So we have my, my THCP relay pool. Having all this pipeline, again, I was able to collect the data, put it in the database, and then I was able to build a dashboard using Grafana. And super easily, in a matter of a couple of hours, I was able to give that to my server guys, and they had to drop down the menu at the top that let them select exactly which rack they wanted and all of that. And they were super happy. Like, I enabled, and it's kind of the same story that Juniper was saying this morning, it's like, how can I enable people outside of the network to consume the network or have visibility into what's happening? So for us, that's another way. Another thing that uh, I personally found super useful is now we're using that also to manage and track this evolution of the states, for example, of interfaces or PGP, like it's not just about uh, uh, counters. Like, for example, what you're seeing here is the status of uh, a set of PGP session and a set of interfaces and their evolution over time. And we're able to actually keep those information in the database. And then there are some systems where what you see here in the orange in the middle means actually the PGP session was flapping for some time, and after it was not flapping. But, and then I can correlate that with all the information about the traffic on the device or the optics or like there's so many information and those systems give you such a flexibility to build your own dashboard, it's just mind-blowing. And, and I've seen actually a lot of network engineers going into that. I haven't seen a single one that told me I regret it. Like, 
And at the same time, I see a lot of us that are not getting this room, and I, I really encourage you to start looking at that. Even if you are not building the collectors in the database, most likely network engineers should own the dashboard and find them and be able to know the query and all of that. I'm actually seeing people in, in you know, other disciplines doing that. And uh, I guess it's, uh, it's really important uh, that, that we get, I guess you get that. Uh, Those are examples you get, uh, uh, you know, you can do so many aggregations and have a lot of uh, options to let people actually die and change dynamically, change the visualization and all those kinds of things. It's really, really an amazing tool. <coughs> so I'm right at the end of my time. As I expected, I will not be able to uh, go over this uh, booklet uh, data. I you have a few minutes for questions. There is some talks on, on YouTube uh, that you can go and you'll actually get even more information about this specific part, which is about how do I populate in our case information uh, into the box. Uh, so hopefully that was uh, helpful. That brings some, some new perspective. And uh, thanks for your time.